Welcome to episode 133 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the tale of Odysseus and the story of Telemachus in Sparta. King Menelaus was holding a feast in his palace in Sparta. Among the throng of his neighbors and relatives, a singer was plucking the strings of his lyre. Tumblers kept the guests amused with their agile leaps and somersaults. Menelaus was celebrating the betrothal of two of his children, Hermione, Helen's daughter, who was to be the bride of Neoptolemus, son of Achilles, and Megapenthes, Menelaus' son by a slave woman, whom the king was giving in marriage to a well-born Spartan girl. In the midst of the joyful tumult, Telemachus and Pisestros arrived and were announced to Menelaus by Etionos, one of his warriors, who asked whether the horses of the strangers were to be unharnessed, or whether because of the great crowd of guests the two young men should be sent to the house of another. Etionos exclaimed Menelaus, what foolish talk is this? You know how many times I have enjoyed the hospitality of others, and that I should never turn a stranger from my door for any reason whatsoever. Have their horses unyoked at once and invite them into the festival. Etinios quickly left the hall with a number of servants. They unharnessed the sweating horses and walked them to the stable where the manger had already been filled. The chariot was set against the white wall near the entrance. The guests were conducted to the palace where a bath had been prepared to cleanse them of the dust of the journey. Then they were taken to King Menelaus, who bade them sit beside him at the board. Telemachus was astonished at the splendor of the hall and the abundance and richness of the fair set before them. Look, Pisestros, he whispered to his friend, look at all that flashing bronze, gold, silver, and ivory, what priceless treasures. Zeus's palace on Olympus cannot be more magnificent. Telemachus had lowered his voice, but Menelaus had caught his last few words. No mortal can compete with Zeus, he said smiling. His palace and all his pos he possesses is imperishable. But it is true that among mortals it might be difficult to find one who could vie with me in wealth. For what I have I have collected by wanderings and hardships. It took me eight years to come home. I was in Cyprus, Phoenicia, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Libya. Now there is a country for you. The lambs are born with horns on their heads. The sheep bear young three times a year, and neither masters nor herdsmen ever lack meat or milk and cheese. But while I was collecting treasure in my lands, my brother in Mycenae was killed by the guile of his faithless wife, so that I cannot enjoy these possessions with a light heart. You must have heard all these things from your fathers, whoever they may be. Believe me, I should be satisfied with a third of what I own, if only the heroes who fell at Troy were still alive. And there is one in particular whom I mourn so bitterly that the thought of him makes food lose its savor and troubles, for no argive had to suffer as greatly as Odysseus, and I do not even know whether he is living or dead. Perhaps his people are mourning his death by now. His old father, Laertes, Penelope, his faithful wife, and his son, Telemachus, who was a small child when his father left for the war. So spoke Menelaus, and he moved the heart of Telemachus so that the tears fell from under his lashes, and he hid his eyes in his crimson robe. At that, the king of Sparta knew that he must be the son of Odysseus. While he was pondering this, Helen came from her fragrant chamber, and her beauty was like that of a goddess. A throng of lovely handmaids surrounded her. Once placed a chair for her, another spread a fleecy rug beneath it, while a third brought her the silver basket she had once received from the queen of Thebes in Egypt. It was filled with spun yarn, and a spindle with violet wool lay on top. The queen seated herself in the chair, but put her feet on a stool, and began to ask her husband about the strangers who had recently arrived. "'Nowhere in the world have I seen anyone who looked so exactly like noble Odysseus as does this youth,' she said softly to Menelaus, and he answered, "'That is just how it seems to me. Hands and feet, the expression of the eyes, the, the way the hair grows, all resemble him. Besides, the young man wept a short time ago when I spoke of Odysseus. Pisestros had heard them talking and now said aloud, You have guessed right, King Menelaus. 
This is Telemachus, the son of Odysseus, but he is too modest to tell you himself. Nestor, my father, sent us together to see if Telemachus cannot find out what has become of his father. Indeed, exclaimed Menelaus, then my guest is really the son of my dearest friend, of the man whom I should receive with the warmest hospitality, if he were here on his way home in his own person. And as the king went on to speak of Odysseus with words of love and longing, all who heard him shed tears. Helen, Telemachus, Menelaus himself, and even the son of Nestor, who was reminded of his own brother, Antilochus, who had died in saving his father before the walls of Troy. But after a time, they remembered how useless and joyless a thing it is to grieve at a feast. They finished their meal, and after the servants had poured water for their hands, prepared to go to their couches. But Helen, the daughter of Zeus, who was versed in magic, cast into the last round of a wine an herb which blots out the memory of pain and eases all sorrow. Any one who drank of the draught so blended would shed no tear for a whole day, not even if his father or mother died, or if his son or brother were slain by a foe before his very eyes. So they all grew merry and talked far into the night. Crimson blankets were spread for the guests on the couches on the portico, but Menelaus and Helen slept in the innermost chamber of the palace. The next morning the king asked his guests the purpose of their journey. When he heard about the suitors and the state of affairs in Ithaca, he said indignantly, And those wretches plan to take the place of great Odysseus? Even as the lion returns to his lair in which a hind has laid to sleep her young while he was away in a fertile valley, so Odysseus will come back and put an end to them, and the end of full terror. Listen. I will tell you what Proteus, the old man in the sea, told me in Egypt. Under my hands he took on one shape after another, but finally I got the better of him and forced him to reveal the destinies of the Argive heroes who were in their homeward journey. In my mind's eye, said the god, I see Odysseus shedding tears of longing on a lonely island. The nymph Calypso is keeping him there against his will, and he has neither a ship no oarsmen to take him home to his native land. This is all I can tell you about your father. Stay with us eleven or twelve days, and when you go, we shall give you precious gifts in parting. Telemachus thanked him, but he did not consent to remain. Then Menelaus gave him a mixing bowl of silver with a rim of gold. It was of incomparable beauty, the work of Hephaestus himself and an abundant morning meal of the meat of goats and sheep was prepared for the guests. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.